Tonight, a U.S. electorate so divided, the crucial question is still unanswered. Who won? Well, I think if they win, I should get all the credit. And if they lose, I should not be blamed at all. Why so many people are already talking about 2024. Mega layoffs slam the metaverse as economic reality hits the virtual dream. They're losing 3.7 billion US a year on this project. Unsanctioned poppy sales take money away from veterans. I feel as if it is a insult to those who have served, who are serving. Fighting back in the spirit of remembrance. This is The National with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thank you for being with us. More than 24 hours after most polls closed tonight, the dust still hasn't settled on the battle for the U.S. Congress. A handful of key races remain too close to call. And while the Republicans may gain a majority in the House of Representatives, there is not the red wave many expected. So here's where things stand tonight. With 218 seats needed to control the House, the Republicans are close, but not there yet. In the Senate, the Republicans need 51 seats to flip it. The Democrats need 50 to keep it. Katie Simpson begins our coverage with the key takeaways from an election day that defied predictions. The raw energy and the joy in this room are signs of a party that outperformed expectations. Democrat John Fetterman narrowly beat his Republican challenger, Dr. Mehmet Oz, in Pennsylvania's Senate race. His path to victory, largely the same as Democrats up and down the ballot across the country. A woman's right to choose one. Supreme Court has got to go! Promises of protecting access to abortion motivated voters. We want Trump! As did fallout from the January 6th attack, Democrats warned of threats to democracy posed by Republicans campaigning on the lie the 2020 election was rigged. The American people have spoken and proven once again that democracy is who we are. Get out the vote. The president is hopeful his party will maintain control of the Senate. And even though it looks as if Republicans will win the House, he's satisfied their margin of victory will be slim. I'm prepared to work with my Republican colleagues. The American people have made clear, I think, that they expect Republicans to be prepared to work with me as well. The knives are out for leaders in the Republican House. They predicted a blowout win, given Joe Biden's low approval ratings, inflation, and a surge in crime. That is a searing indictment of the Republican Party. That is a searing indictment of the message that we have been sending to the voters. They looked at all of that and said, and looked at the Republican alternative and said, no thanks. If Republicans are looking for someone to point a finger at, Donald Trump isn't interested in taking any responsibility. Well, I think if they win, I should get all the credit. And if they lose, I should not be blamed at all. Donald Trump is expected to announce he's running for president next week. His advisors are reportedly urging him to reconsider. But if history is to be any guide, Donald Trump will do what he wants. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And so let's bring in Paul Hunter from Washington. Paul, in terms of what we just heard at the end of Katie's story, what's the thinking now on Donald Trump? Look, regardless how he wants to spin things, Adrian, last night's results are a hard slap at Trump, at his brand, and at the whole MAGA crowd. I mean, th there is now an argument that says this signals the end of Trump as a Republican option for the White House. It's over. Uh, he put his reputation on the midterms ballot with his endorsements, with his teasing of another White House run, and it mostly failed. Uh, voters, Republican voters, said, no, we're tired of it all. And if he doesn't back down, his potential Republican challengers, Ron DeSantis, chief among them, are now energized, emboldened, and unafraid of Donald Trump. Which leads, obviously, to the question about how Joe Biden now sees 2024. You know... Fact is, it may well still be the case that he, too, now has to think hard about his future. No matter the final numbers, life's about to get a lot harder for Biden on Capitol Hill. And he turns 80 in a few days. There will be Democrats who will now say, thanks, Joe, but it's time. Ironically enough, a weakened Trump may be the thing that actually allows Biden to step aside. With Trump now less of a threat, he could give way for someone else without losing face. If so... 
the real lasting effect of these midterms, Adrian, may well be changes all round for the 2024. All right, Paul Hunter back in Washington. Thanks, Paul. You're welcome. We have more reaction and analysis coming up. Washington Post correspondent Karun Demergen and New York Post editor Kelly Jane Torrens, who were with us for our special coverage last night, are back to help explain what happened and what comes next. In a televised exchange between grim-faced officials, Russia announced the withdrawal of its forces from Kherson. That would mark a major defeat, a retreat from the capital of a region that Moscow claims as part of Russia. But as David Common explained, some in Ukraine are urging caution. What's happening here may well symbolize the past two months of the war. A Russian tank unaware of a nearby Ukrainian soldier with a weapon. Repeatedly, the Russians have been caught off guard by Ukraine's fall offensive, including here in the key city of Kherson, a major prize for Russia at the start of the war. Ukraine has been steadily advancing on it. Now a rare public announcement of retreat from the Russian defense ministry. Thousands of soldiers said to be moving out, the city abandoned. But Russia's retreat doesn't mean it's leaving the region. Its forces will still be on the other side of the formidable Dnieper River, defending from newly made trenches and mini bunkers like these. But this withdrawal announcement, carefully choreographed and televised, is over land Russia only just last month claimed as its own, prepared to defend by all means, including nuclear. Now Ukrainian troops are flooding it. The situation for the Russians in Kherson is militarily unsustainable. They've got huge log logistic difficulties to bring reinforcements across the Dnieper River. So um, it's very difficult for the Russians to sustain this with the Ukrainian forces just 20 kilometers away. There are some, though, who think this retreat is just a Russian ruse. They are uh, uh, using such the tactic uh, just to mislead, uh, mislead us. The Russians are not ready to leave the city, Ukraine's president said tonight, but we have a strategy. Russia has been clearing the city of civilians, so could possibly be instead hiding now, preparing for an urban fight. One way or the other, it'll be very clear soon. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. Lawyers for U.S. basketball star Brittany Griner says she is now on her way to a Russian prison colony. Griner was arrested at a Moscow airport in February after cannabis-infused vape canisters were found in her luggage. She was sentenced to nine years in prison. The location of this penal colony hasn't been reported. Russia's prison colonies have a reputation for harsh conditions. Just days after Elon Musk cut half the staff at Twitter, Facebook's parent company, Meta, is laying off 11,000 people. That's 13% of its global workforce. Some of the cuts right here in Canada. Part of the reason, a major gamble that so far is just not paying off. Philippe de Montigny explains. It's the largest wave of layoffs in the tech giant's history. Employees of Meta, formerly known as Facebook, were told by email. It's just very inhuman, a very cold experience. Like, I get that companies grow a little bit too fast sometimes and you need to make cuts based on your profitability long term. This was ultimately my call um, and it was, it was you know, one of the hardest calls that I've, I've had to make. This summer, Meta saw its revenue fall year over year for the first time ever, sinking further this past quarter. And Meta's not alone. Much of big tech has been struggling and bleeding jobs after the pandemic helped boost revenues and led to hiring sprees. Over 100,000 employees in tech have been laid off in 2022. Uh, Meta accounts for 11,000 uh, of those 100,000 employees. With virtual worlds becoming accessible across all your devices, this comes as the company is betting big bucks on the metaverse, pouring a fortune into building this immersive digital universe where people can create avatars of themselves to shop and socialize. This shows that metaverse was a bust. They're losing 3.7 billion US a year on this project and there's no demonstration is going to work. 
the metaverse is going to allow Earlier this year, the company announced plans to set up a Canadian engineering hub in Toronto to help build it by hiring 2,500 workers in the next five years. Ontario Premier Doug Ford is confident it's still a good business move for Meta. I think they're going to continue, my, myself, they're going to continue to grow. I know they announced that 11,000 worldwide. They haven't given me numbers if it affects Ontario, but the tech sector here is second to none. Meta did not specify how many Canadian jobs were cut, only that it remains committed to its expansion here, which it says has been years in the making. Philippe de Montigny, CBC News, Toronto. The mayor of the Alberta village of Coots told a federal commission that convoy protesters had effectively held his community hostage. When I look for the definition of uh, a domestic terrorist, these people seem to fit that bill, and yet no one ever labeled them that. Jim Willett testified he believed the RCMP was caught off guard and lost control when convoy protesters effectively blockaded a border crossing into the U.S. last winter. After Ottawa declared the Federal Emergencies Act, the RCMP arrested four men at the blockade and said they seized a cache of weapons and body armor. There are warnings tonight of a triple health threat on the way that could land more Canadians in already stretched hospitals. Three respiratory viruses hitting at precisely the same time. As Lauren Pelly explains, it has experts urging everyone to do what they can to help. They're going to have it twice daily. Pharmacies remain busy as the viruses behind COVID and RSV keep spreading. The last few weeks have been extremely chaotic. Today, a new warning. In the coming months, Ontario will likely face the triple threat of respiratory illnesses. We are already seeing an early start to the flu season. Provincial figures show the rate of influenza A infections has spiked since September, with one in 10 tests now coming back positive. Countrywide, cases are also going up. Public health labs like this one in Vancouver are closely tracking patient samples. At the moment, we are seeing influenza creeping up. Um, and samples come in through long-term care facilities, some children's hospital, adult hospitals. Southern Hemisphere flu seasons could signal what's coming next. In Chile, there was also an early start for influenza A, but hospitalizations wound up lower than pre-pandemic seasons, in part thanks to the flu shot. It reduced the risk of being hospitalized by nearly 50 percent. It's possible that we might peak and decline earlier as well. Still, Canadian hospital teams are bracing for a tough winter. Just today, an Ottawa facility announced the opening of a second pediatric ICU, while a London, Ontario hospital network said patients coming to its emergency departments should expect a 20-hour wait. It's a little bit of a perfect storm right now because of uh, not only the, the numbers, but obviously we have a lot of uh, manpower challenges. To reduce your chance of serious illness, medical experts recommend getting a COVID booster and a flu shot. Today, you will have two shots. Mm -hmm. Even getting them both at once, like the Prime Minister just did. How was that? Just a pinch. Keeping ourselves safe, keeping our friends safe, keeping our loved ones safe, uh, and not overloading frontline health workers uh, means uh, making sure we're up to date in our booster shots. And Lauren, lowering your risk of ending up in hospital right now, I guess really means getting just getting back to the basics. For sure. I mean, the conversation about masking is really heating up again in Canada. We've heard from experts across the country who are saying it's a good time to wear a mask in indoor settings. And of course, the old advice applies to just stay home when you're sick. That's part of the reason I'm out here tonight instead of in studio with you. I got over a cold and why not take a few extra precautions? But we know all of these sorts of measures did help against COVID. And in the pandemic, we've seen that it was able to beat back influenza, nearly wiping it out for more than a year. Adrian? All right, smart and thoughtful on your part. That's Lauren Pelly in Toronto. Thank you, Lauren. In New Brunswick, a major diesel price hike has a lot of people wondering how they're just going to get by. The fuel jumped by 68 cents, pushing the price of a litre over $3. As Gareth Hampshire shows us, for those who must fill up to make a living, that hurts. Harvesting the corn crop at his farm west of Fredericton just got a lot more costly for David Coburn. The weekend's 68-cent overnight jump in diesel price is the highest on record in New Brunswick. 
My first reaction was that was going to add about $1,000 a day to our production costs. Diesel prices here have been among the highest in the country and close to a dollar more per litre than a number of other provinces. We're running uh, seven farm tractors, uh, a skid steer loader, uh, three tandem trucks and a combine and they all take diesel fuel and so it's a major, major hit. It comes down in part to the fact the Irving oil refinery has been undergoing maintenance, according to this analyst. As you see supply tighten, you can see extreme increase in prices. Once the Irving oil refinery does return to service in St. John, I would expect prices to begin moderating somewhat quickly. New Brunswickers have been wondering for some time why they often have to pay more for fuel than their neighbors in Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island. The provincial government is now promising action to try to change that. We went through a series of steps and we framed up legislation that I'm looking forward to uh, bringing into the House very shortly uh, that's going to help um, harmonize that so that we can have that consistency. Aligning prices with PEI and Nova Scotia will provide some relief, but diesel has been on the rise there too. This lobster fisherman in Nova Scotia is not sure he can make any money this year with diesel as high as it is. Oh, phenomenal. It's doubled, if not more. And we haven't left the wharf. And the price per pound doesn't look good either. Nonetheless, he's giving it a go, like David Coburn back at the farm, who's hoping for a better season next year. Gareth Hampshire, CBC News, Fredericton. That fuel is crucial to so many, but the cost of a warming planet was the focus at the UN Climate Summit in Egypt. On the table, richer nations compensating poorer countries for historical climate damage. But as Chris Brown explains, not all big players are on board. In the language of climate change and UN jargon, Egypt calls this the Implementation Summit, or show us the money. Canada was tasked with wrangling up cash to help developing nations mitigate climate change, and they've fallen short. We've mobilized more than $80 billion to help developing countries tackle the impacts of climate change, re reduce, re reduce their emissions. We, we said we would be at $100 billion in 2020, so we're not there yet. Urgent. So the plan is to have the private sector fill the funding gap. And we're calling this effort the Energy Transition Accelerator. U.S. climate czar John Kerry says American companies can pay someone else to cut their emissions, and the money raised will help fund new carbon-neutral energy sources in developing countries. And this is an approach that can deliver deep and rapid emission reductions. What do we want? But carbon offsetting has a mixed track record says this Canadian activist. We've already heard here at COP27 that overly relying on offsets is quite a questionable thing to do and doesn't always deliver results. On the other contentious issue this summit, compensation for poor nations for climate damage, the U.S. has been non-committal, whereas China now says it will provide money. We're willing to make a contribution, said climate chief Xi Jinhua. China and the U.S. had agreed to cooperate on climate, but the detente fell apart after U.S. Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan this summer. It's up to the U.S. to repair things, said Xi, saying there have been no official talks since. China is the world's largest emitter, so it's not surprising the United States wants to focus on mitigating ongoing costs, while China wants the U.S. to pay for its actions in the past. Chris Brown, CBC News in Sharm el-Sheikh. Just weeks after being pounded by Hurricane Ian, Florida is bracing for another hard hit. Hurricane Nicole is bearing down fast. Strong winds and storm surges are already hitting Florida's east coast. Nicole is projected to land north of Miami overnight as a Category 1 hurricane. So that would make it the first November hurricane to make U.S. landfall in 37 years. Environment Canada warns Nicole could bring some heavy rain and strong winds to much of eastern Canada this weekend. A symbol of Remembrance Day being sold online for profit. Have a look at this. Tell me what goes through your mind. Unauthorized poppies on sites like Amazon. Why the Legion struggles to stop it. And family doctors are becoming more and more scarce.
A lot of people don't really know the reason that we don't have availability. We follow one doc to find out. But first, you've won our Jeopardy! POC exhibition match. Matea Roach back to winning again, so how does it feel this time around? You're seeing these other contestants. Uh, I had so much fun. We're back in two. Jeopardy's Tournament of Champions is underway, and Canada's Matea Roach already has one win under her belt. What are Europium and Einsteinium putting it together? That's correct. <laughs> you wagered nothing, leaving you with 17,600. Congratulations. That win came in at an exhibition match that aired on Tuesday. Now, Friday, he, she heads to the semifinals. Roach won 23 games in a row earlier this year. That is the fifth longest streak in the show's history. And today she told Ian what it was like to head back for this tournament. I think the experience of getting to go back, it felt kind of like going home or alternatively like going to summer camp. You know, you're seeing your Jeopardy friends that you don't normally get to hang out with. You're seeing the fantastic team. You're seeing these other contestants. Uh, I had so much fun. You can catch Ian's full interview with Jeopardy champ Matea Roach this Sunday right here on The National. Now, the Royal Canadian Legion is pushing back against some unauthorized online poppy sales. It owns the poppy image trademark, and sales help veterans and their families. Thomas Dagla shows how online retailers are profiting from the symbol of sacrifice. Mike Turner served eight years in the military. I left the forces. And keeps memories of those who gave their lives. Have a look at this. Tell me what goes through your mind. When we showed him what we found online, he wasn't impressed. I feel as if it is a insult to those who have served, who are serving, and have died for our country. For sale on big sites like Amazon, eBay, and Etsy this week, dozens of seemingly unauthorized poppy pins made by third-party providers, like a 10-pack for $18.99, even poppies in other colors, which the Royal Canadian Legion does not support. Right on the back of our box we have... Turner worries about the money raised going to someone's pocket instead of helping veterans. Some military members deal with PTSD. Some members deal with homelessness. What is lost is the, uh, the funds that have the ability to change some of these people's lives. The Legion holds a trademark on the Remembrance Poppy and says just this year it's learned of 1,600 reported trademark violations. Sometimes these products and these websites are created overseas, somewhere else, we cannot find them, we don't know who's behind them, and in those instances we sometimes do involve our legal team. We reached out to the big online sellers to ask them about what we found. eBay says it's now in touch with the Legion. Amazon took down many Poppy products and apologized. As we come together... To in the UK this year, Amazon trumpeted its deal with the Royal British Legion to sell official pins online. Now the company plans to offer a similar arrangement in Canada. Trademark law puts the onus on the Legion to protect its symbols. The only thing that sadly you can do is to send a notice to Amazon that this product is infringing uh, on your trademark and so should be taken down. In other words, veterans are likely to face the same trouble next year. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. There is another symbol of remembrance gaining some momentum in Manitoba. You get the chills when you come driving down Eveline yeah. and see all those faces. A simple idea now stretching for kilometers, but first. Democrats had a strong night. Republicans are shaking off a less than stellar performance, what it could mean for the next presidential race. Our midterm panel is back next. Welcome back. As we track the results still coming in from Tuesday's midterms, tonight a message of optimism from the U.S. President. I felt good during the whole process. I thought we were going to do fine. While any seat lost is painful, some good Democrats didn't win the last night. Democrats had a strong night. While control of Congress is still up in the air, one narrative so many were predicting did not happen. No Republican red tsunami or even red wave. Joe Biden and the Democrats bucked historic trends. 
So let's get the band back together. Washington Post correspondent Karun Demergen, who is here all night long, is back home in D.C. And Kelly Jane Torrance, an editor at the New York Post, who is also here, is still here. We are keeping her now. So, uh, Karun, if we can start uh, with you. Joe Biden made that speech today saying, you know, good day for democracy, sounding so optimistic. How much of that is real? How much of that is show? Well, look, the, the White House and the Democrats were panicking heading into last night, but I think they actually are quite happy. They are breathing a collective sigh of relief that things were not so much worse as they were expecting them to be. And look, this is a credit to the fact that their messaging seems to have worked better than anybody thought. Abortion was on the ballot. Women turned out in full force. This has been a trend that's been going for several elections now, that women are forced to be reckoned with when it comes to the, the, the national elections, and that what happened last night was no exception and just built on that trend. Even and more strikingly, uh, Gen Z, the young people, the kids, <laughs> they're not kids, they're young adults, but they came out, and this has never been really a trend before. Um, people always talk about the youth vote, but the youth vote doesn't turn out, and so people tend to think about that very jadedly and skeptically, but this time, young people actually did come out in droves, and the turnout made a difference for Democrats. Um, normally, you don't see a close margin among independents. Normally, you see the opposition party sweep through and take on huge gains, and that was stopped, because there were a lot of Democrats that came out because independents split pretty equally between Democrats and Republicans, and that is not common but for the way midterm elections go in the first term of a presidency. All right, so votes count, obviously. So, Kelly Jane, last night when you were here, you were partially editing the New York Post while you're here. And, and part of that was talking about what's the headline. I want to show everybody the headline that was chosen today for your newspaper, and it says, The Future, meaning DeSantis, Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida. Why, why is he the story of the moment for you? Well, first of all, he was one of the few clear winners. There were so many close races, some that people expected because some didn't expect to be that close. He won by 20 points in a state, as we discussed last night, seen as a swing state. Uh, he was the first Republican to win Miami-Dade County, uh, which is heavily Hispanic, about 70% or more, uh, since Jeb Bush in 2002. And Jeb, of course, speaks uh, fluent Spanish and his wife is Mexican. So this was a big story. Uh, and of course, the uh, crowd at the DeSantis celebration, uh, I think, made an interesting point. Instead of saying four more years, which of course is what he has now as governor, they were chanting two more years, mm. clearly hoping he will be the nominee in 2024 for the Republican presidential uh, nomination. And of course, many, many, many Republicans are hoping he will too, or at least that his biggest rival right now, Donald Trump, is not. Uh, so that is one of the reasons that he was, was such a big part of the story, because uh, Donald Trump really was one of the losers last night, of course. Right. And he, Donald Trump, in the last few days, started attacking DeSantis, called him desanctimonious, clearly felt threatened by him. Well, he should be. All right. So <laughs> one, of the, one of the concerns heading into the midterm elections was the sheer number of people who had questioned the legitimacy of 2020, you know, who, who were running for office sometimes in positions where they would be in charge of elections. Karun, what happened there? Well, they didn't win. Um, you know, Democrats gambled then on hoping, backing some of these candidates, hoping that they would win their primaries and be easier campaign against the general election. That seemed like it was maybe trending uh, as a mistake heading into last night. There were a lot of Republicans who are Trump supporters, who were questioners of the 2020 election that seemed like they were polling very, very strongly. But they didn't win in most cases. And in many cases, they actually conceded, which is good. But there's one major race still outstanding. Um, we are still watching the Arizona governor's race. Carrie Lake, who is one of those questioners of the 2020 election, who has suggested that she might not accept the results if she loses. This is she's neck and neck, closing the gap with Democrat Katie Hobbs. And um, you know this could go on for a long time because Arizona does have a recount law where if things are within half a percentage point, which they are right now, um, this can be recounted. And so this could be, um, create several successive stages of are there still going to be major elections where the Republicans either don't accept uh, the results if they're not good, or it just the debate continues on right. ad infinitum, and we're still debating the same issues in 2020 about do election results actually count and stick? So is that is that the race you're keeping a last eye on? If there's one thing you're watching right now, is it Arizona? Well, it's, uh, we're watching Arizona for what that means in terms of just kind of putting that 
question and election denialism to rest or not, and also what it means in terms of you know Trump backing 2020 questioning candidates being uh, rising. But I actually think the one I'm keeping a closer eye on is Georgia. We all are. The, the Warnock-Walker race is headed into a recount. Um, the future of the Senate is, again, just like 2020, going to rest on the outcome of it. We are going to be now having a runoff between these two candidates. There is all the incentive in the world for the parties to drive out the vote for them because a vote for Warnock is going to be a vote for Democrats leading the Senate. A vote for Walker is also a vote for Republicans leading the Senate. This right. is going to be very, very high stakes what, coming down to December 6th to see if if we have divided Congress or we have unified GOP control on the slimmest of margins. All right. One last thought to you, Kelly Jane. What are you watching for? And I, I realize Karun took two good ones there. <laughs> That's <Sorry>. fine. <laughs> um, you know, I'm watching, of course, uh, Senate uh, Nevada is still... Uh, we're still waiting for some results there. Um, but, you know, I am watching not only just specific races, but what the feeling is. And clearly, uh, Republicans had a terrible night, but I'm not so sure Democrats, in a way, had as good of a night as they think. I think they're put into a bit of a difficult position mm -hmm. uh, because Biden did, you know, triumph in many ways. Uh, this was not a, you know, it was seen as a referendum on the president, didn't do nearly as badly as, as they thought. But, you know, look at exit polls. The majority of voters don't want Joe Biden to run in 2024. So Democrats have a bit of a problem. They seemed like they were getting ready to push him out, and voters don't want him. But, hey, he's, he's, he's done well. What, what are they going to do? All right, Kelly Jane Torrance, Karun Demergent, you are amazing. Thank you for spending time with us. Thank you. Thank you. In this country, many Canadians are struggling to find a family doctor, and the problem may only get worse. Fewer medical students are choosing family medicine. But for those doctors sticking with it, a look at the challenges they face next. Family doctors are the first line of defense for patients. They are access points into the healthcare system and serve as its foundation. But right across the country, there is a critical shortage. That's having ripple effects, sending more people into already overburdened ERs. So Christine Birak takes us into one doctor's practice to explain why some physicians are just opting out and shows us one community's fix for the problem. <laughs> Why is it so hard to see a family doctor? I would start by saying I think we're facing a crisis in family medicine. I know we have solutions. We know what to do. We just have to, to go ahead and do it. But normally, do you take it once a day? No, no. When I go home, I'm, I'm never done. My day is never done. I don't think that patients understand the full picture of what we do behind the scenes. which is why we're making an early morning house call. Good morning. Hi. How's it going, Laura? Good, you? I don't think we're waking you, are we? No. <laughs> we wanted to see why family doctors are disappearing and what can be done about it. We don't want to disturb you, just fly on the wall, but we're hoping to just follow you through your day. All right. Laura Sang's a new family doctor in saint Hippolyte, Quebec, north of Montreal. At 6.30, she's already working. I have 12 documents, two results, and four messages. And that's just overnight. And I'm just going through this person's uh, chart, which is quite lengthy. That was especially the appeal for me of uh, family medicine, was that you, you get to follow, you know, people over time for the rest of their lives. Sometimes, you know, you're giving wonderful news. Sometimes, you know, it's not good news. But either way, you're kind of that constant. On top of that, family doctors are essentially entrepreneurs. You heard that right. Doctors run small businesses. Many are only paid when they're with a patient. On average, it's about $40 per appointment or visit. That entails kind of when the person comes into my office, kind of keeping track of how long they were there, what sorts of things I did for them, um, what health conditions uh, and underlying things they have, because that does affect um, sort of how you're allowed to bill. Which means her workday hasn't actually started yet. While medical school prepared Sang to be a doctor, no one said much about renting office space, buying medical equipment, computer systems, along with hiring and paying staff.
In the office, it's back to back to back patients. With medical issues ranging from lack of sleep and mental health challenges to infections and cancer. What I didn't expect was sort of all the other hats that I wear as a family doctor. I, I find myself sometimes being in the role more of psychologist because patients can't afford them. And sometimes it's been sort of pharmacists trying to do like a, a review of all their medications. I'm sort of the secretary in uh, figuring out, okay, which appointments that I've requested have been done, uh, which specialists have they seen, what are they still missing, what kinds of tests uh, do they still need to have. Dr. Sang is now several hours and several patients into her day, but it is lunchtime, but it looks like you're also still working. Yes. I have so many things to get done, so I usually just take a bite, keep typing back and forth, and that's usually what my lunch hour looks like. And her day is far from over. A lot of people don't really know uh, the reality, and, and sometimes, you know, the reason that we don't have availability, it's like someone left the tap running, and depending on the week, it's all running all the way, or it's more of a yeah. slow trickle. But and it's overflowing. Never, but it's never off. There is no off. The Canadian Medical Association says burnout among family physicians has gone from 33% in 2017 to 57% in 2021, and it's getting worse. Surveys already show that one in five Canadians do not have a family doctor, but there are solutions. So where are we headed? So we're headed to Cambridge Delta Clinic, which has just hired a brand new physician who will be taking on new patients. Donna Gravel works for the city of Cambridge, Ontario, which has had a shortage of family doctors for years. She's a medical recruiter who knows what it takes to attract family doctors. We're hearing from family doctors saying they're under this incredible amount of pressure. They're running their own business with a ton of administration and overhead and trying to see patients. And it's a lot to manage. How has Cambridge dealt with some of those pressures? Well, I think because we've formed FOES, which are family health organizations, and we also have two family health teams. Instead of one doctor opening an office, several doctors work together and share overhead and expenses. They also work closely with a team of other professionals, pharmacists, social workers, nurses, dietitians, psychologists, and others offering direct access to care. And the more doctors there are in the group, the easier it is for each of them. If you are off for a week, you're sharing your after hours, and that really eases the pressures that they're not looking after their own patients 24 hours a day. So if they're in a group of four, they would be on call for their patients every four nights. Well, now we have 40 in the group, so it's one in 40. But these doctors also do need to make money. And what's the model here? And so they get a stipend per year per patients that they have. And then they also bill for the services that they do when the patients come to see them. It's called capitation. Doctors like Laura Sang in Quebec get paid for every visit or a fee for service. But most family doctors in Cambridge get paid a set amount based on the number of patients they have. They get a higher amount for older patients and they can still bill for other services. Gravel drops off flowers for a new doctor she's recruited and leaves us with another doc she brought to Cambridge years ago. Makalai Kumanen is the new president of the Ontario College of Family Physicians. We know that fewer medical students are choosing family medicine as a specialty. I think we know that primary care has chronically been underfunded. She says burnout, fewer family medicine grads and an aging population are creating the perfect storm. And governments can easily embrace models like the ones being used in Cambridge. Ultimately, it's really recognizing how important we are as a sector, how important we are as a foundation to our healthcare system, and how we can build funding in to support that sector. In Quebec, Dr. Sang clocks out after 6 p.m., but her day isn't over. She hopes working in teams and better payment options will become the norm, but adds her patients are always her focus. Just seeing how appreciative my patients are and keeps me motivated to keep um, doing the job that I do and, and being there for them because that's ultimately why I'm here is to, to help people. There are cures for this crisis. 
Now, provincial governments must decide on a treatment plan before more doctors leave family medicine. Christine Virac, CBC News, saint Hippolyte, Quebec. And to that point, British Columbia seems to have a bit of an answer. It plans to launch a new payment model for family doctors in February. So it would take into account how much time they spend with the patient, how complex the patient's needs are, and the administrative costs. Now, next on The National, a family stumbles onto a piece of World War history in their basement. So 1939 to 1945 is the first one. What they did with it in our moment. Well, that was an attempted royal egging that just missed King Charles at an event in Northern England. Restrained by police, the protester reportedly yelled that the country had been built on the blood of slaves. People in the crowd began booing and chanting, God save the king. A 23-year-old student is in custody. As Remembrance Day approaches, it's already transformed one Manitoba city. Everyone who walks Selkirk streets can see the names and faces of those in the community who went to war. Cameron McIntosh shows us how the connection that creates is often per powerful and personal. Streetlight by streetlight, banners honoring veterans, put faces to names, Selkirk, Manitoba has long vowed to never forget. You get the chills when you come driving down Eveline yeah. and see all those faces yeah. and they served for us. It stretches more than two kilometers. You know what strikes me is how young most of them are in their pictures. Like, that tells the story right now. John Austin and Jan Chanis are with the Selkirk Legion, which is producing and posting the banners at the request of veterans' families. These banners will be, you know, they're a thing for the future to, for kids to look at and remember. Selkirk isn't the first and it's not the only community doing this, but interest here has been extremely high. Three years ago, this started off with about 30 banners. Now there's more than 140, including one for my own grandfather. He seldom spoke of his service. For many of these veterans' families, that's common. Well, growing up with my dad, I, I didn't know. Glenn Lay's father, Jack, was part of something extraordinary, the Dufferin Gang. 31 men and women, all from the same block, who enlisted at once, believed to be a Canadian record. Their banners hang on that block. Everybody just bought in. Like, it's, it's just, it's just a simple way of remembering. What do you think your dad would think of all this? Ah, uh, that's a good one. I think they would have been proud of this, but in, but they would have just, like, what's the big fuss? You would have grown up around a lot of these people? Yes. Mayor Larry Johansson's dad was also a veteran. He says this doesn't just speak to the past. The community respects the veterans that fought in the wars, uh, with all the turmoil in the world right now, we respect what's going on. Meanwhile, inside the Legion, the plan is to rotate the banners year-round. If people are that interested, or, or getting behind this, what does that tell you? It still means something. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Selkirk. Extraordinary. Here's something else meaningful. Second World War medals given to a soldier who served in the war but found decades later in the walls of an Ontario basement. So Carrie and Krista O'Brien discovered the box of medals when they started renovations and they made it their mission to return them. Their dedication to honour a soldier is our moment. We're getting our basement renovated and um, during the demolition, the construction foreman came upstairs and said, you're never going to guess what I found. Turned out it was a box containing some war medals. My grandfather was a veteran. He served with the first special service force in uh, World War II. Uh, he was a paratrooper. So as soon as I saw the medals, my first thought was, okay, I need to get them to, to who they belong to. Mm -hmm. He sent a text saying that he was looking for Wayne Webster, which when he said that about the medals, I knew exactly what medals they were. So he served with the Stormont Dundas Glengarry Highlanders. He went overseas on May 1943, and then he was killed in France in May of 1944. I was super grateful to hear the work that they did in order to track me down. It feels good to get them back with the family who owns them. They deserve to be 
given the honor and prestige of the man who earned those medals. It's something that you can't replace. It's, um, it's just amazing. I love it. Yeah, it's lovely. So they had some help in part from a number of people, the library, Ancestry.com, uh, CBC reporter Joe Pavia. How did those medals end up in the walls? It seems that back in the day they were kept on, an, on a little shelf in the unfinished part of the basement over time. It, it was adjusted, walls put in, and they just sat there waiting to be found. That is The National for November the 9th. Thank you for being with us and have a good night.